Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. This is our Electricity League show of the week again, and this time we're joined by Josh and Gareth from ExtraTime.ie. So anyway, we'll get cracking on uh, the big game of the week: Rovers versus Bows. Yeah, two nil. Um, yeah, three wins in a row now for Rovers and Bows this season. It's another comfortable enough win for a Rovers team who are you know going to battle for Europe this year and looked pretty convincing against Bows. But I think the bigger point from the game is the Bows look like they're in real, real trouble. Um, they just they look very listless in attack. They're decent enough defensively, but they look quite listless in attack and Brandon Miele and Trevor Clark with the goals, Rovers just continuing that kind of process of bedding in more and more young players and trying to make the team younger and younger, which looks to be in the long term to be starting to work a little bit. Yeah. What do you think yourself, Josh? Yeah, again, like I said, the Bows probably are struggling a little bit. I wouldn't say they're in too much danger. I think there's probably worse teams for them in the league. But, again, like Rovers, trying to bet in a lot of young talent. Sule, Oscar Brennan, both kind of coming in the middle of the park last couple of weeks. They're developing as players, but I think, as I said, it could come at a cost of Bows at the end, but they'll probably be safe coming the end of the season. And Gareth? Yeah, I think Bows, the big problem is they just can't score goals at the moment. They have the likes of Akinade is out injured at the moment. He's been out injured since the start of the season. Um, so if they can get him back kind of mid-season, he might be able to kick on with a few goals. It's, it's another good win for Rovers, though, and they really look, they really look like they're going to go from strength to strength now. They have two wins on the bounce, and after having a, kind of a terrible start to the season where they, they just couldn't win or couldn't even put the ball in the net and, and stop conceding goals, they've managed to now string two results together. So a young side looks like they're going to go from strength to strength. Dave, Dave would be happy in here, will not he? Yeah. For sure, I think Bowes as well. Been about it all week, yeah. <laughs> I think Bowes as well as you say, with Akinade being out injured, they've left themselves really, really short with striking options. Yeah. Like Diddy Corkin came back from injury on Friday night and played, but other than that, you've got Kaleem Simon, who Kaleem's we both know personally very well. But I've played with him, and he's not a striker. No. He's more of a wide midfielder, maybe can play in a ten role or just off the striker, but. He's not really a natural striker, and they've really, really missed Ishmael Akinade, and they've missed Dini Corcoran as well, and he's not been fit. Yeah, and so. another one as well, probably since, I know it was midway sure last year, but since Ayman Ben Mohammed left, they're kind of really yeah. lacking that little bit of spark and that little bit of creativity in the middle of the park as well. Yeah, you lose one of the most creative players in the league, a player who just, even if he wasn't creating goals or assists every week, we just called an absolute mayhem down the left wing. He's just so quick, so good on the ball, such a tidy footballer. That without him, obviously you're going to miss him, but not only do they miss him, they just haven't replaced him whatsoever. I know Kaleem has come in, but Kaleem is not the level of player that Eamon is yet. Kaleem's a couple of years younger than Eamon, and he still has a ways to go to become at a level where we've seen Eamon's been called into the Tunisian national team squad a couple of yeah. times now since he's moved to Tunisia. So you can't really replace him with a player who's another year or so away from possibly getting to that level. Kaleem has the talent to do that, but... He's not quite there yet. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, we'll move on to uh, top versus bottom clash, anyway, from uh, Galway versus Cork 1 1. Fair result? Yeah, well, look, it was probably a surprise to everyone that it, it's the first couple of points Cork have dropped this season, and Galway have kind of gone a bit resurgent in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, they're starting to string a few results, yeah. poor results in fairness. They couldn't yeah. buy a point, and then all of a sudden they go and get four off uh, Cork and Dundalk, who have been the, the league's pay setters the last couple of years. So yeah. it's been a big surprise, but. Um, uh, Shane Keegan finally starting to instill that like little bit of work rate that he had out, that he had out extra deals into his Galway team. They seem to want to fight for him now, and they seem to have that little bit of talent going forward now that they can they can create chances, score goals, and eventually get themselves off the bottom of the table. Yeah, I, I think the the result was, it was always going to happen eventually to Cork, but I suppose Galway they would have been. Pretty, pretty positive going in, I suppose, the week's training, having got a good result the week before as well. So to get another one against Cork now means that maybe Shane Keegan can finally start clicking. It's always, it's always kind of a bit difficult when a new manager comes in, tries to, especially with a full-time team, tries to get a new squad. Um, he's, new, he's got a lot of new players who've come in with him there. He's taken some guys from the first division, some guys from other Premier Division clubs. So he's trying to get them all to bed in. So I think it was always going to kind of be the kind of late April, start of May, before he was going to start getting the gel together. So he'll be looking to build on there in the next two weeks before the mid-season break. Yeah, I think the signs have been there with Galway since the very start of the season. Like they've got eight draws so far this season. So it's not as if they've been getting you know, destroyed by teams who are just completely outclassed. Yeah. Defensively, they actually look quite solid. They've not looked... They're like a team who are going to leak a million goals, yeah. but as you say, they don't really score a lot. Ronald Murphy's kind of brought in as their striker, and I'm not really sure he's 
going to be up to it or not. He's never played in the League of Ireland before. He's been over in England and stuff. So it's a t- it's a tough one for Galway to really you know find a goal scorer that's going to keep them up because I think at the back you see Stephen Fallon score yeah. on Friday night. Stephen Fallon's one of the better central defenders in the league. You know he could probably s- still start for Cork. Now yeah. or could start for Cork if he was back down there, or could start for Limerick if he was there. So he'd walk into most other teams in the league. So they've got talent, especially going backward. I think in the case of Cork, you know, it's a one all draw away from home against Galway. I don't think they're going to be too disappointed. Yeah, it's, still it's, not, it's not like they lost and they have to bounce back or anything. It's like yeah. still unbeaten. Yeah, it's exactly. Going, yeah. Like in between Shepherd and Maguire, they've got 20 goals this season already. So, yeah. you know, it's they neither of them score on Friday night and they don't win the game. But how often are Maguire and Shepherd both not going to score in a game? Exactly. So yeah. I don't think there's much worry for Cork. They've got yeah. such a lead. Like that lead hasn't been, I don't think, even the dock had that sort of lead last year, the no. year before. So to have, I think it's 14 points at this stage is just ridiculous. 12 after Friday night. Yeah. 12, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just kind of ridiculous going into kind of the halfway through the season nearly. And they've, they're, yeah. they're, I know they're going to have European games and they probably will lose the odd game during the summer. But to have other teams have to have that much pressure on, especially the dock aren't even picking up results at the moment. They're losing games. So I, I don't see any other team like Breyer in second, but we'll get on to them in a bit, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll get on to Dundalk and Sligo. 4 0 to uh, Dundalk and a uh, hat trick for Jamie McGrath. Yeah. Second half show from Dundalk, really. Kind of trudged along in the first half against Sligo. I didn't play very well by all accounts, but Jamie McGrath's got that little bit of quality and that little bit of guile that sometimes Dundalk would miss so far this season. And it's great to see him getting goals from a Dundalk point of view that he's kind of maybe going to take on the mantle now from a Daryl Horgan or whatever. He's going to move into that kind of Do you think he's good position with the team. I think Jamie McGrath's got all the talent in the world, yeah, to move on and be that level of player with a good bit of coaching and some quality game time with good players. Yeah. Um, like Dundalk have had their little blip, blip and stuff, but I think they're good. I think Dundalk are a good side. I think they're still going to be up there. And, you know, it's a convincing enough win against what, let's be honest, is a pretty poor Sligo side. Yeah, I think, just going back to McGrath there for a second, I think he's he's probably a slightly different player than Horgan. He's probably kind of a more of a of a Robbie Benson type of figure again. And yeah. another lad who came, came through UCD, really good feet, quite big, quite dangly, but he's really kind of developed over the last couple of years at, at Pats and stuff. And he, he's really gone on to make his name. Now, I felt really sorry for him when he came, kind of came into Dundalk, kind of a lot of injuries here and there. So he's only really starting to find his feet now. And, a hat trick in in what's probably his what third or fourth game back in the team. Yeah, yeah, he's really starting to, I suppose, cement his cement his name now on the Dundalk team. I'm not sure it would be one of the more influential players in the league this year as well. Okay, uh, well we move on to uh, Bray then. We were talking about them there a second ago. Yeah, I think um, Bray they've really like I know they they're spending a lot of money up there. They've got some players who two, three, four years ago no one would have ever thought would have ended up with Bray Wanderers. <laughs> Um, they're certainly not really out there for for the warm weather or anything out by the seaside. So to, to have gone out there for whatever Parry Kenny and kind of the club, the club's board and the coaches there have kind of sold them, it kind of shows that they are building something. They're still not getting great attendances, but the couple of hundred that are going through the gates um, are kind of seeing some top class football. They've managed to get themselves not, in, not just into European consideration, but to be one of Cork's only real challengers for the league this year. Um, maybe Dundalk might jump in there as well, but there's only really two or three teams that look like they might have the quality to go to go anywhere. Um, Gary McCabe just can't stop scoring goals either. He's 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 got a ridiculous amount at this point in the season. He he's looking like he's really going to go on if he can push on there. There's going to be teams looking for him in July and August. So from Bray's point of view, they're going to have to just make sure they keep all their players, and then who knows? But I definitely think they'll end up looking for European football next year if they keep going the way they're going. Yeah, I think like with Gary, I think with Gary McCabe especially like. Vault seen for the last six seven years at Shamrock Rovers that he's an exceptional talent. Scored some unbelievable goals, gone through some really great patches of form for Rovers, but never really you'd say has put it together for an entire season. But with the newfound freedom and I think responsibility that he's got, Bray kind of carrying the load where he is the playmaker. He's what everything goes through for them. Obviously you've got Dylan Connolly and Aaron Green there and stuff as well in attack who are good players, but they're not maybe of the influence of Gary McCabe and the experience and the league that he has and the quality that he has. 12 goals this season for a man who's an attacking midfielder yeah. is absolutely phenomenal by anyone's standard. Like, and you look at the other two players who score from on Friday night, Ryan Brennan and Aaron Green. They're two Premier Division players who've been in top four, top five sides, won league titles, won cups. 
that's not Bray Wanderers from the last few years. Bray Wanderers have been a team who've been battling relegation and average, have, yeah, very average yeah. and below average, and have brought through a couple of decent players and not really done much else other than that. But they seem to have just put together an exceptional squad, and you've seen it at the start of the season when you looked at it on paper. You went, if this comes together, they're going to be a good side. And Harry Kenny is completely blended them together. They look a really exceptional side and a team who realistically could probably challenge Cork for the title if Cork do go through a patchy run of form and break keep this up. Yeah, absolutely. And again, just going back to an individual player, Gary McCabe, what a season he's had, 12 goals. Yeah, 12 goals already. More than, more 12 than goals in 13 McGuire. games. More than Shani <laughs> McGuire, he was a striker playing for, playing for Cork, who probably got on one of the best runs ever seen in League of Ireland history. And yeah. It's just amazing, really, but the remarkable difference in the Gary McCabe we seen last year at Shamrock Rovers playing almost as a defensive midfield player to now where he's playing where he's playing the hub behind the striker and I think the main difference is probably that he's, he's finally happy playing football again. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. From a Finn Harps perspective with it as well, like you have to look at it and look at the squad and look at the team they've assembled for this season and kind of go that the Ollie Horgan spark and everything that happened up there last year where they managed to gave off relegation and stuff is kind of out the window now the only big or big name signing they made in the off season was Paddy McCourt and he's not really come off he looks like the Paddy McCourt of post Celtic years knocking around the lower leagues in England where he was very very patchy and they probably don't have as much quality as maybe any other squad in the league really they look probably the weakest of the 12 sides and he's going to have to do something drastic either during the summer or whether it be the club change of manager or whatever it is they need to do something drastic if they're going to survive because yeah. at the minute they look dead and buried. And that they're losing that five of the last five <laughs> as well, which doesn't help. Yeah. So it doesn't, there's, uh, I wouldn't imagine the morale is too high in no, their dressing room anyway. I moment. wouldn't say so by any stretch of the imagination. I'd say they're feeling quite down on themselves after what was a pretty okay start to the season. Hmm. They've kind of just dropped off a cliff now. They're between them and Galway now. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah. Void to do. Anyway, we'll get on to uh, your boys, St. Pat's. Well, not Pat's, man. <laughs> 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 Um, yeah, two 0 win over Drada. Yeah. Um a good win for or a good win for Pats, but it's just says that now. It's conti- <laughs> it's continuous pat it's continuous patchy form from them this season. Um there's a reason they're right down there in the mix to go down. But you know, it's a good win over Drada. Drada are gonna be down there with Pats. I think Pats are gonna stay down there this season. I don't think they're consistent enough. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't like to see them go down though. That's no, I think if it's good to have those Dublin rivalries. I think if worst case scenario is, for I think the league, being honest, and maybe club team from you know provincial clubs will argue differently. But that you look down at the bottom of the table at the minute, and there's a distinct possibility that both Bows and Pats go down, if Galway's form improves and if Sligo's form improves. So all of a sudden you're looking at Shamrock Rovers, maybe being the only Dublin club. Is. realistically left in the Premier Division when, God, 10 years ago there was, what, 6 or 7? Yeah. yeah. And you were just sporting Fingals and UCD and everything like that up there too. You know, it's... Dublin football doesn't look in the greatest of... Um, shapes. Yeah, greatest of shapes at the minute, but I don't know how you feel on Pats anyway. Yeah, well, I think Pats a week ago were actually bottom of the league and for, I don't know when Pats were last bottom of the league, if if ever, since they've since like around 2008, maybe was it? Maybe, um, maybe the, when Jeff Kenna came yeah, in. Yeah, maybe the yeah, Jeff yeah, Kenna yeah. spell in early. Yeah, but to uh, see Pats bottom but of the league is certainly a surprise. I know Bows have been going <laughs> through, uh, Bows have been struggling over the last few years, but for Pats to be down there as well, it's kind of building on what happened at the last three, four months of last season where they just couldn't string anything together. And I was yeah. surprised Buckley's still there. He's, I think, he's the longest serving manager in the whole league. Yeah. Um, so to see him still there so many years later and he's. Si- like they've got a tune of an against Strata, but like Strata aren't exactly the world beaters by, no. by any by any means of the imagination. It is at home as well. Um, but their, their crowds are really really low. There, I think, like yeah. 350, 400 people in mm. in in a, every game. So they're not going to be exactly making money to fill the full time team if they continue to to struggle. Mm. And to be honest with you, if Buckley if Buckley's coming in, into kind of like a bit of a Wenger situation at Arsenal, where he's going to sit there for years and years, yeah. maybe. So book we'll you out. <laughs> get the planes flying over. Um, we'll have to no, see, we'll have to see how to we'll have to see how it goes anyway. <laughs> no, but yeah. Uh, Josh on draw had a, I think two wins in their last twelve now. Yeah. That's poor, poor form from a side who started the season quite brightly. Yeah, it's been difficult and I think the the point I think everyone will pick up on was probably the turning point was when Killian Brennan got injured. Yeah. 
and he's just come back into the into the team now. I've seen he started there on on Friday night. Obviously, didn't make too much of a difference against his his old team in Saint Pat's, but I think I trust Pete Mann. I think he's very honest, and I think we'll see a very honest strata team now from from now until the end of the season. They've still got firepower. I said they've got Killian Brennan. They've got. Uh, Sean Brennan, who can obviously create quite a bit, but and they've got Carmen up front, top too. as well. So there's obviously goals in the team. So I think it's the I just said two wins or whatever in the last twelve. It's been a purple patch for them, but now I think it's a point where we could see draw, turn again because they're they're not that bad of a side, and they they have got quite a good number of names in that team. So yeah, I think I think they I can see them going on a run of maybe four or five games without a defeat in the next near future. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll move on to the last game then uh, from yesterday. So uh, Limerick won, Derry City won. Fair result. Um. Yeah, probably on the balance of a fair result from two teams who are probably would both admit they're woefully out of form at the minute. Neither of them have won many games since pretty much mid March, and obviously there's extenuating circumstances with Derry City, which we're all very aware of. But at some point, they are gonna have to put a run of games together to you know make sure that they're in that European hunt come the end yeah. of the season. They a run of games on the pitch and. You know, maybe bring back a bit more positivity towards the club in terms of on the pitch stuff. Obviously, it's a very difficult thing to get over, but um, you know, one all away at Limerick, I think ninety nine percent of teams in the league would probably be happy enough with that. Mark Fields is the easiest place to go to, and you know, oh Benny's goal late on for Limerick is kind of a you know a kick in the teeth for Derry. It would have been a big big win for them away from home, but I think they'll be happy enough. Um, with a one-all draw, I think Limerick will probably be quite disappointed to only pick up a point at home. Yeah, definitely. That's four one-all draws in five for them as well. Yeah, which is shows either that they've got a lot of bottle to come back from one nil down when they're not playing well in games, or that they're actually not good enough to be winning in games. Yeah, or their firepower. I don't think sure. their forms are any better since they got rid of Martin Russell later. I think no. they've just, I think they've got a lot worse since then. I think he'd only lost two games maybe before. I he don't was... think they've won since Martin Russell left. Yeah, well I think they won one. They won the. Oh, they won the first, first game, game after, and... but after that's just been draw, draw, draw. And one thing Martin Russell's really good at was scoring goals, and yeah. like a Limerick team scoring one against Derry, who haven't been exactly strong at the back over the last number of weeks, and um, just shows kind of that they've changed up their system. I know they're not conceding as many, but they're yeah. they're not scoring as many and to be honest with you, I think Limerick fans if they score five to see four every game the season they won't really mind too much yeah. um, I think with Derry though it doesn't help that they're also obviously they've ha- had difficult difficult few weeks but it doesn't help that they're also maybe out of their home ground this season as yeah. well so they're having to travel further away from where they're maybe most comfortable in and kind of when a situation like that happens um, and they've had to move away from home as well so it can yeah. kind of just make things a bit more difficult and take them longer to adjust but the fact they've got, got some draws over the last few weeks does show they've kind of moved on from the purple patch of loads of defeats um, to a couple of draws so maybe wins are just around, just around the horizon yeah Josh? Yeah, again, Derry especially, I feel you'd have to. You st- I still feel very, very sorry for them. Like I mean, they were probably yeah. they were probably on their way to up there to to be challenging yeah. with Cork, like realistically. They like, had a great, they had a had a great start to the season. Yeah, and good wins just against Dundalk at home and stuff, and then something like that happens, and it's really just out the window. And not only the tragedy, but they lost probably the best player in the yeah. in the team. Definitely and the their defensive, the league. their defensive rock, where you're kind of now scrambling to replace him. Yeah, in the centre yeah. of that defence, it's and not it's like he was sold or anything. Like they exactly. got money for it. It's just yeah, a... and it's not as if it's even within a transfer window or something where you can bring in another central defender. You're kind of now a man light You're stuck, in yeah. central defence. League of Ireland clubs aren't best blessed with the flack that they've got. Well, they maybe have three five, or, yeah, maybe five or six central defenders. Yeah. They probably had four going yeah. into the season, and now they have three. So it that's kind of a struggle for them, but. I think from a Limerick point of view, the biggest problem for them is that if Rogerio Tossi doesn't score, they don't really seem to win. have a lot of power, firepower and they don't, as you say, seem to win games. Yeah. So I think it's going to be very difficult for Limerick if Tossi was to get injured or if he was to leave or anything like that. Yeah. I think it would be very difficult for Limerick going forward second half of the season because I don't see going to be having words where the goals Clark, come no. from. On your behalf. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Dino, Dino didn't score many goals last season at Rovers either, so he needs to find he, the shooting he, he, he is a watcher, so uh, yeah. be careful now you don't get oh, it. Listen, listen Dino's a good player, but I think he'll say himself he hadn't scored a lot of goals in the last couple of years. Okay. So. Well, on that note, anyway, uh, we'll leave it there. If you guys uh, want to leave any comments or anything, leave them below. Uh, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Thank you very much for watching Irish Football Fan TV. Have a great weekend.